I like to call this meeting to order. Settle down. Settle down. Oh. <clears throat> the council is present. Uh, we have all of our members here. That's Ira. Ira Marks. I, I write and I draw. That, that, that. Oh, One, hold on. Slow down there, sir. Apologize. And uh, and I, Caitlin Cadju. She's here, present. I. Uh, so the only meeting uh, item on our agenda today is, uh, should we stop doing these funny bits at the beginning of the Cartoon Feelings episode? Ah, yes, the bits. Mm-hmm. We've received mm-hmm. feedback from mm-hmm. ourselves that yes. it's very funny and hilarious. Yes, agreed, agreed. But also mm-hmm. takes a long time to edit. Ah, uh, yes, a lot of a lot of effort. Yes, ah, so yes. I will mm-hmm. call the vote. Mm-hmm. Do we have I? I. I. I agree. We... We agree to not do mm. this bit anymore. So I'll just just check that. No more bits. All right. That was our only meeting item. So. Okay. I, well, I have a second meeting I, item. If I could just pose. Uh, yes, Ira. Uh, you, you have a hand raised. I know we have this kind of whole steampunk vibe going at these meetings, but do I have to wear the big gear? necklace kind of chess piece at, at every meeting or yes we have been over this before like i feel like we get the point it, the gears the machinery so, yeah. of politics this society grinding like the people down but do i have albatross of capitalism around your neck i still have and i think it's important that we remember that as we bandy about with people's lives that's fair just wanted to ask i think that makes sense to me and i'm the one who's in charge so i motion i second the motion just checking that off all right so in honor of our last council meeting i declare this meeting adjourned please sign off as you leave the building your name sir uh my name is ira marks i write and i draw comics Mm -hmm. i have a more political voice today (laughs) you just sounds quite authoritative you're gonna have to get rid of that because this is the last council meeting and I, the undersigned, Caitlin Kadju, animator and illustrator, am also here. And this is a podcast about cartoons where two lifelong artists and fans talk about the mysterious and the magical process of bringing cartoon stories to life for the people. <laughs> for the rich people. Ayo! And in this episode, we, the council, have gathered together to cast our votes on the last three episodes of Netflix's Arcane. Motion pass. <clears throat> Welcome to Cartoon Feelings! Caitlin, are you left-handed? No. Are you? No. I don't know a lot of left-handed people. I I, uh, thought maybe Jinx was left-handed, so I was looking it up on Reddit, as one does. And while sometimes she is, I don't know if you picked up on that in your 400th viewing or so, um, but I guess she's just sort of generally ambidextrous, which is either part of the story or just an error. (laughs) <laughs> in animated. <laughs> well, I was going to say, like, it might not be an error so much as maybe it's just easier for camera angles and whatever's happening for them to be like, yeah, this scene, she's left-handed. <laughs> Do you think it's that type of show where they just, they're in After Effects and they're like, you know what, this scene would look better if it was um, panning left to right. So flip they just it. flip it. Yeah. Maybe. Who am I to understand any of the creative process? That's just why I have a podcast about it. <laughs> Well, I think as a fan, you you have some ownership. Oh, that's true. I got to tell right? you, you got to pick one. <laughs> well, historically, you know, there's there's a superstition around the left hand. So I thought, I'm like, oh, that's kind of an interesting little detail. But it doesn't seem relevant at all. I disagree, actually. And here's why. Okay. <laughs> Left-handedness has historically, as you say, been associated with, you know, suspicious negative, etc. Bad. That's why the Latin for left is sinister. Mm-hmm. Anyway, 
as you can see by your evidence that you uh, uh, no doubt have, Jinx is ambidextrous. Well, I posit that this was an intentional choice on the part of the showrunners to show uh, the sort of purgatory state mm. of Jinx as a moral character um, that clearly like is an active terrorist and does bad things and like murders people, but also like it kind of isn't her fault because of mental illness and like traumatic upbringing and like maybe she has the potential to come back onto the side of good question mark mm. and that it's sort of about her the possibility of her redemption is this something i think it is yeah she's like a coin that's spinning on its end and we're mm. kind of it seems like part of this the tense tension of the show is we're waiting to see which side she's going to fall on the left or the right hand there you go of the coin or yeah hand coin <laughs> It's it's a very uh, I guess Batman villain. I guess Batman just really managed to lock in all the um, conflicted personality villain types so early on that it's it's really hard not to kind of pin her. Well, you even mentioned that she's kind of Harley Quinn ish. Oh yeah, Batman yeah. thing. So I guess we're just sort of stuck with some superhero tropes in this show a little bit just because they did it so well the first time around. That's it. Definitely like. Most of the characters in this have, like, an origin story. So there's something very superhero-y about it. I have closing thoughts on the season that I will say for the end, as I'm sure you do, that you've yeah. been holding on to for uh, many months now. Waiting. <laughs> um, I had more on the hand thing, because it just whenever I sit down to watch something that we're going to talk about or I feel like I'm supposed to have something either entertaining and or smart to say about I start to think about it very differently and um I sort of jump out of the entertainment aspect of it I'm like what were these people thinking when they made it that way I'm not like I like this or don't like it I really just kind of want to know why choices were made and um this show like every piece of art is <laughs> becomes about the artist to me when I'm watching it. I'm like, this show is such about the conflict of like the, the unpredictable nature of the creative individual trying to reckon with um, just general society. Like Jinx is like a creative embodiment of not a creative embodiment. She's like this sort of like pulsing energy of unpredictable expression right she kind of like she makes art visually like with her uh when she draws on her little weaponry or even crafts something that's like artistic and then whenever we see her visions of um like self-doubt or like these other voices that kind of like pull her to the dark side it's always basically like scribbles on a desk and it just started me down the path of like artists making things about what it's like to be or feel like an artist or like an outsider um, because Jinx doesn't really have like a practical skill set, right? She's kind of just lost. Really good at bombs. Gun is a practical skill set. <laughs> In this world, it is. It seems like she would have found her place, but she's still, she's just a, a wild, a wily teen. This is a very teen show. Oh, yeah. Well, and I would say... This might spiral off into an unrelated tangent, and I hope it doesn't. So keep me on task. It's just the thought that I had while you were describing that and talking about gun and stuff is like, I mean, I do think like ultimately what the show is about, at least in the broad strokes of the actual plot, is this like class conflict. Uh, and I do find it kind of interesting that Jinx is just like preternaturally really good at gun, like I mentioned, and um, just like amazing shot a little chaotic and you know unhit but like when she was a kid and she's like in that firing range and she's just like nailing all these targets like she has a natural talent for that and then you look at Kaylin, who like is totally different but also really really good at gun they don't really go out of their way to draw a parallel between these two characters but it's just hmm. like a contrast that you can naturally make and then wonder, you know, like, how would she, how would Jinx have turned out if she was raised in a completely different environment? Because 
Caitlin is like winning shooting competitions. Right. Uh, you know, and like rubbing shoulders with, you know, the wealthy people of Piltover because of her parents and her just like family situation. Mm. And then Jinx grew up like in a hole in the ground <laughs> with nothing and an obvious mental illness that nobody seems to even really be aware of, frankly, let alone treat in any way. Uh, like, those are the main differences between them. And, you know, maybe things could have been significantly different if she had had different resources and different people taking care of her and access to different things. Yeah, I mean, every everybody in this show, is, not everybody, but at least the more the characters we're supposed to care about have something tragic about them like they've either fallen through the cracks or they didn't have the right people in the right places at the right time for them i was also thinking about how vi when she is trying to um decide if she's you know doing the right thing whether she it's like do i help jinx or do i like put an end to her do i put her out of her misery do i save our city by you know what what choice do i make she always hears her father figure which what was his name i forget Oh, Vander. Vander. She always hears like his voice and he's he's basically like her uh her kind of Jiminy Cricket ish character. And it's it just was always interesting to me, like um like when you don't have anything, when you don't have someone guiding you, you have to kind of like create that imaginary thing for yourself. Like char- like Pinocchio is does is a character without much. And he has to like create these imaginary figures to kind of like guide him. Wait, to make her it's not real. <laughs> well, all right. Wait, he's... hold on. <laughs> this changes everything. Well, I guess he's real, but he's not. Uh, but he represents yeah. something for Pinocchio, right? But I guess, yeah, talking grasshopper. What the hell? Or cricket? <laughs> uh, okay, Pinocchio. Weird. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I have a lot of questions about the world of Pinocchio now. In the same way, I have a lot of questions about this show, because there's also bat people all of a sudden in episode seven. Yeah, and I'm loving it. <laughs> okay, I don't remember what point I was trying to make about uh, a conscience. Oh, I, I guess I was just thinking how Vi is also just, they have so few resources, they're just scraping at the bottom of the barrel to try to find um, some sense of like what they're supposed to be <laughs> as, they, yeah. as they as they come of age i don't know that there's enough to like reach a conclusion about it but it's kind of fun just to think about it and like where are people getting their morals from mm-hmm. because that is true like vi literally has like visions in a way at least once of like vander being like all right get up and get back at him champ kind of a deal and um, mm-hmm. he is very like generically paternal in that way and Jinx doesn't have that. And a lot of the time she's having like straight up visions of you know, like dead people. And it feels more like torturous than anything else. And she's also kind of like projecting that void onto Silco as her dad character and just like mm-hmm. arbitrarily adopting his set of values. Because that's something that's interesting to me. Is that after the fact, when you kind of finish this, it's like, does Jinx really care about any of the actual conflict here like at least silco i mean he was kind of a dick and a crazy person but at least he was like i have a goal in mind like i don't like the way that we were treated and i'm gonna i want us to be liberated and independent and run our own Mm -hmm. thing and it's like does jinx care about any of that stuff or is she just picking a side because he was sort of her dad uh i think it's that i think she just it well, he was there in that moment, right? It's kind of one of those things where if if someone appears in the right moment, you kind of latch on to them. They they come to represent something, uh, even though she doesn't seem clear on like what that is exactly because he's so kind of mysterious and broken as well. Like what ki- purpose can he really serve for her at the end of the day? Uh, not a lot. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Let's get in, in the right headspace. Um, it, I'm just nervous. This is my last chance ever to talk about this show. And I, I know, because I, I will like not talk things. to you about it after this. Like, I don't want to hear it. I'm this done. This is that. <laughs> okay, episode seven. As, I, as I've as i said before, this this show um, dips into like little little pieces of cinema throughout. It's a very 
it's a very cinematic show in that it, I feel it's respectful of uh, the language of cinema in some ways that I've really come to appreciate over the, the past many weeks of viewing it. And a, a little thing I was, I guess this isn't necessarily a cinematic thing. It's more of like a, a literary or cultural thing, but there's a very Peter Pan-ish feeling to when we're introduced to the tree tree land that echo lives in yeah where where all the like hoverboard kids live i'm like oh this is very lost boys yeah it honestly it feels completely detached like the best comparison i can think of for it is it feels like if you were traveling to it in a video game that there would have to be a loading sequence between (laughs) you know like they are not just connected so i'm like how do you get how do you get here like how does nobody know about this place oh good point like geographically like yeah is that it's very mysterious and it is kind of cool. Like I like it, uh, but it does just feel like, how did you hide this all away? You know, how far away are you? Yeah, that's a good point. I was trying to think of, of uh, where things were because it, okay. We don't know where the tree is. We don't, <laughs> what else don't we know? So the council meets on the red moon. No. Okay. But at the end, she shoots no. the missile at the moon. No, that is not what happens. Right, Close. Well, there, it's a big part of the sky in the area. No, they're in. This is confusing, I will grant you, too, because it's unclear to me if it's also like the Hexgate zone. But there's basically a big tower. And you see it a lot throughout this series. I think it's at the end of the very first episode when... Vi um, and Powder are like sitting there being like, they're going to respect us someday kind of a deal. And then like off on the skyline, there's like the big, it's like looking at the castle of like the people that you wish you were. They're up there. Mm-hmm. Okay. The red moon just happens to be there. All right. I guess the I found the red moon very distracting. Just It's quite it's... large. Yeah. I was nervous about it. You should be. Like what? But um... Back to the treehouse. I, I like the introduction of that because it just sort of brightened the mood for for a moment. I guess uh, you know, I guess it's like the show needed to introduce sort of like something kind of hopeful or like a realm where these characters can prosper a little bit because everything else seemed like generally awful. You were either condemned to like a carnival wasteland underground, or you're in like just a really nice kind of cold marble. High rise. Yeah, and you definitely need to have money to live there. So if you don't, you're never going to move there. But you can have this tree, which is nice. Yeah, I. uh, it very much is treated in this show like a, here's a thing and it's like not resolved. We're introducing it in the last, you know, three episodes. (laughs) Yeah. This is obviously not going to be like the crux of the story, what everything hinges on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I am curious what role that would serve in a season two or wherever we're going with the show. But it, to me, it sort of feels like, I don't know if they intended for this, but it does feel like, okay, so Zon, I guess the not pilt over part of town mm-hmm. needs to just move on. Like, I, I don't know. Is it, is it opening up a possibility of hope? Yes. But is it also kind of saying like, your situation is hopeless, though, and you guys need to move, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like, should the Zon people just give up and pack up and leave? Like, what? I don't know. Well, I think that's sort of the problem with serialized storytelling in general. It, what I think I'll always have this issue, and I, I don't, it's not that I don't think things can't go on and good things can come, and I, I like um, watching writers like, you know, lay out the chessboard in a different way for like a new season. That's always a thrill, but there's something lost in the meaning of a season when you have to continue the story. So they introduce this treehouse idea, which like you're saying, like kind of dilutes the, the play of the art deco world of Piltover and that art nouveau world of Zahn, because those things being in high contrast with you, with each other, makes it that much more compelling and gives both a certain meaning. But then when you add in other things, so you can tell more story, it kind of 
makes the meaning of the or two original things kind of confusing is how I just feel in general yeah. with this stuff. Like, I know we want more of this show, but I'm like, you know, the way it ends could have been slightly, we'll, we'll get there, but if it was tied up a little neater where there were no questions, I think the whole season's meaning would be like so much richer. That's interesting because, you know, I don't know. I don't agree necessarily, but I also think it would be fine if they never made another season. Like, I'm actually really happy with the way that this ended, and I feel like I don't need more information. I will be happy to have it. I will watch it. That is for sure. But if they just came out and said, like, that's the end of the show, I actually would love that. Because I love it when they're just, they're like, this is the state of stuff. This is how it ended up. This is the end of the story. Like, shit sucks. Um... I really like that, actually. And when well, it, me too. I, th- I think we're saying the same thing. I feel like it is a meaningful thing the way it ends. Yeah. Like, do you have... Uh, well, we'll get there with the questions of... <laughs> I guess it's hard not to just jump right it's to like, the end. It's like, skip to the end. <laughs> so, okay. Well, I'll, I don't, maybe I made this point in another episode. I probably have. So, like, another example of this is season one of Stranger Things to me had this idea that ran through the course of that whole season. And this was an idea that was totally buried and ruined by making a second and third season. And it's the idea that like Winona Ryder's character is going through like a, the worst experience you could imagine your child's disappeared. He's probably dead, but what if there was one way he could not be dead because that, in a, in a moment of like utter despair, like what else could you possibly hope for? But that one like kind of miracle that would return your loved one to you. And the show that first season was really about that tension of like, if something, if the world was just slightly magical, I could have the person I love back. But if I did get them back, what would it mean about the universe I'm in? You know, it's kind of like a pet cemetery thing. It's like, well, Getting the dead back is not always the best thing. You know, there's... I remember when the old guy says that famous line. (laughs) Exactly. So, but I I just think that's such a great idea to kind of dwell on for a season of TV and just have it be over. But then there's another season and now it's about the plot and how we love these kids. And now we're watching them grow up and now they're dressed like Ghostbusters. And there's nothing more said about that idea of like the trauma of family and all this stuff. It's all buried under just remixing plot and like all these other fun things that make the show keep going. It's like, okay, I'm having fun, but we really lost what this thing was about. And now we just have a thing that doesn't mean anything. Like if this show continues, it will inevitably be nothing more than like a thing that is just always with us with characters that are mixing and matching in whatever ways. But right now it's like kind of this magical thing. Like if the world just exploded at the end of the show, as it almost implies, it's so much more meaningful of a story, right? I feel like that's kind of what you're like, you feel resolved with this adventure, right? Yeah. It's like, things don't have to end clearly or even like satisfyingly to be satisfying. If that makes sense. But well, let's just like reserve a little square of podcast space right here, though, to like hate on sequels and television, because <laughs> I was having this exact same conversation today with some of my coworkers. And like recently, I've just sort of come to a realization that I've always sort of known, but it's just really cemented in a way that makes me wonder if I'll ever even really do it again. I was like, I don't care about TV anymore. I don't want to watch your prestige drama anymore. I don't want to. I get tired of just opening up Netflix and looking through all the stuff and just, it's garbage. And I feel exactly the same way as you were describing about Stranger Things. Uh, and I thought the first season was so good. Like it really, it was like 80s nostalgia, but not so overdone. It felt a lot more legitimate or genuine. And the characters were interesting stuff was spooky and not like nothing felt unfresh i guess despite the fact that it was drawing from all these very obvious sources of inspiration it still felt like a fresh new thing that was like very seasonal and halloweeny and great and i couldn't even finish the third season it was just unbearable to me and it's really bizarre 
how often we fall into the trap. I say we, like showrunners and stuff. I'm not involved in mm. any of this. <laughs> but we fall into this trap of being like, oh, my thing was like a runaway hit. People yeah. must want more of that. Oh my God. Okay. What can I give them that's more of that? Uh, and then they just give you trash. I'm like I'm, now I'm being like really hostile and I apologize, <laughs> but. They give you entertainment. They don't give you like substance or. Like, yeah. Society, it's because right? they're or... just like, oh, okay. I have shown you something that I made possibly from the depths of my heart and my own creation. Mm -hmm. And you right. loved it. And you told me that you loved it. And I saw that and I absorbed it and I became a mirror to just reflect mm. that shit back to you for the next like five to seven years or whatever. And there's, there's nothing more is coming from me. <laughs> I'm not outputting any new stuff. <laughs> I'm just going to keep giving you that same thing over and over again. And you're going to get sick and you're going to die. Not really, right. but uh, well, eventually I cannot remember. So this is kind of embarrassing. Did we end up doing a frozen episode? <laughs> no. Okay, yeah. I was like, I know we talked about it, and I couldn't remember. Well, we you did and one. I, you and I saw Frozen two together. Yeah, so and I thought Frozen two was interesting, and I'm bringing this up right now because Frozen I enjoyed as a what I felt was like a throwback to princess movies of me growing up. So I felt mm -hmm. like I was right in the demographic to enjoy it. I didn't like love it, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I was like, ah, oh, this reminds me of like Beauty and the Beast and stuff like I used to watch when I was a kid. So I'm kind of here for it. And Frozen 2 came out and I was like, okay, this is interesting, mostly because it's very strange and very disjointed and a lot of confusing stuff is happening here. And then the second time mm -hmm. I saw it, I was like, I'm not really feeling it. And then I watched the Disney Plus docuseries about the making of Frozen 2. That was really illuminating because it was like so obvious how stressful and weird the production process was and how focus grouped it was. And these people are constantly freaking out because they don't know how to give the audience what they loved in Frozen 1. And I was just like, yeah. oh my God, you spent all of that time trying to figure <laughs> out how to give them the same thing. Because, and yeah. like, nobody did that for the first one. That's not why it was so good. So like, I know people out there enjoyed Frozen 2, but I do think like, frozen mania is kind of over a little yeah. bit at this point but it probably didn't have to be actually i just don't think that there was anything in frozen 2 to sustain it and i even remember like there elsa has this whole arc in those series like and the the second one is just the exact same thing again where she's like trying to find herself again i was like well that's pretty weird because she already did that so did we really need that make the movie about something else that's weird I love the ice horse. Like, that's very cool. But like... Oh, yeah. The ice horse is great. Yeah. It's if, super good. If a character, you know, if a character is designed well enough, it really can only embody one great idea, I think. Right? Like, um, if we get a season two of this, what becomes of Jinx slash Powder? I mean, I, I could truly care less, even though I appreciate the artistry of, of her in this show as much as anybody i doesn't mean i want to continue to like spend time with my friend or whatever and like no no ill will towards anybody that feels that way about characters like i've talked about characters that have been important to me that i don't want to see harmed but it's like jinx is so much of a thing that it's she's such a, an artistic element like i was trying to still trying to figure out in my brain the way she's sort of this cobbled together concept of possibly uh, the journey of making this show in the way that she, I, I feel like you can see slight tweaks in the, the animation getting better over these episodes when you watch them all together uh, in the way I did, like kind of for the first time, maybe you're not seeing this as much now watching it a whole bunch, but you can see like subtleties in um, the character's body language it, it's just, uh, it feels more believable and or natural, like going later in the show. And, and Jinx is just so richly complicated, like in her own little like manic brain that you can tell it's just so lovingly done. But I don't need to see more of it because it's, it's the vessel is filled. The Jinx vessel is filled <laughs> with story and anything else like would just break it or overfill it as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Um, it, there's just nothing more to really be said. Yeah. She fulfilled her arc. 
<laughs> Easily, this um, could be a thing where if season two comes out, like, I know I'll watch it. Obviously, I will. Well, yeah. I loved this. Like, I'm definitely going to. But it might be a thing where I just have to disregard it. <laughs> you know, it just depends. Like, to preserve my enjoyment of the previous iterations. And, like, I'm not, I don't know. I just think there's, like, I see both sides of people who are like, oh, they remade my favorite thing. Like, I'm so mad. When? I'm like, okay. You know, like, the world is moving on and it's okay to change with it. Whatever. But, like, sometimes personally it does kind of affect how you feel and reflect back on the thing you like. So, yeah, I see both sides to that. I get that. And I don't, I don't want that to happen with this because I do think it is very special. And I see people online being like, who lived and who died at the end? We're just going to be talking about the end, right? Like, we're just doing it. <laughs> yeah. James fires a big bomb at a building. She blows it up. The Does she, though? credits. I mean, I don't know. Uh, we don't see a well, blow this, up, but like, presumably. Exactly. Well, I feel like this is... Um... Look, we, we've got a masterful team of animators here. They can they can leave you hanging or not leave you hanging at any way they want, but they're all being very intentional. And I feel like the end, they play it exactly right. It's the it's the end of fucking Inception where the top is still spinning just and you don't get one extra frame that tells you one thing or the other. You just get that like, oh, like they cut away from Jinx exactly at the moment where her skin may or may not peel back off her face because of like the the intensity of that shot being taken. And then you see it break through the glass. But is the bomb active? I don't know. Is Jinx that chaotic where she would even activate the bomb? Is it just going to fall dead in the middle of the table? Who knows? Anything could literally happen in the ne beginning of the next season, right? And that's in a way cool, like good for you for like leaving it open. But also like, I don't know. Come on. Pull the, close the curtain and the story. Well, see, it's funny. I don't, I feel somebody. really like <laughs> parallel to you. Like I feel similar to that, but like I, cause what really where I was going with that is that I see online people being like, I wonder if anyone survived. Like I wonder what happened or um, people will be like theory crafting about maybe somebody like had magic armor that like protects them at the last minute. And like, I wonder if this person died in the crash or is she going to survive and be in the next season? And I'm like, I don't care. Like, I don't care and I don't need to know. And it, it's still like, I'll watch the next season, whatever. It's just that I'm happy the way that it ended. I don't want to see. I actually prefer it this way. I kind of like that they just left it open at the end. And it's just like, I think this story is a little unsatisfying by design. And I mm -hmm. like that because it's not obviously not going to give you the happy ending thing. It's okay. very explicit about That's that up front. Yeah. And... It's like, I do, I like things that leave it a little bit open. And this kind of goes back to what we were saying in the last episode um, about like the relationship between a creator and the audience, where uh, I at least was kind of getting at the idea that things are more successful when you let the audience interact with it and kind of mm -hmm. play with it. And I, I think that's one of those things where I can sort of decide how I feel based on all of the events of the series up to the end what I think really happened. And then mm. that can just be my ending and then it's done. And I almost think that like something about sequels and TV and serialization that can quote unquote ruin that is when they do give you the answer. That's I think where things start to get a little weird mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't matter. Like really the only thing that we needed to know was like, does she take the shot? Like what does yeah. Jinx choose to do at the end? Right. And she made that choice and we saw that. And then after that, it like doesn't really matter what happens to any of those people, which right. is kind of crazy. But that's like I it I remember having that empty sort of feeling when the credits rolled. And then I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, that was good. I liked that. It OK, I like that take on it because it's more um, we're, we're really kind of in her point of view for that final moment. It, it was making me think of, uh, did you ever watch The Sopranos? No. All right. Well, I'm just going to spoil- I hate drama very... television. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to spoil the very end of the very last episode for everybody. Do you mind? I know of it already, so no, go ahead. Okay. Well, for if you haven't seen the last episode of The Sopranos, it ends with the family united in a diner and uh, a journey song is playing on the radio. Everybody's eating french fries. And it's a, a mafia story, so it's always you're always looking over your shoulder because somebody might um, be there to kill you. And a mysterious character goes to the bathroom, 
We don't see them come out and our maiden character, Tony Soprano, sitting at the table. He turns his head half away and then the song and everything cuts to black. So was he shot by the guy? Is the show just over? Is this just where we end? Because the narrator, you know, the the director has told us this is the end. Or is this just the last thing the character seen? So Jinx is kind of a similar way. Like I could say the animators have left me hanging, which makes me feel annoyed. But the way you're kind of describing it, you're saying like, no, this is we're we're following Jinx's story. Jinx made the shot and she at least blacks out probably in that moment. So we're really just seeing like her last memory of this moment as well. And then we cut to like where the bomb goes from there. And maybe then we're also seeing the people at that meeting, what their last memory of that was before whatever happens, happens. So that makes me uh, happier with the ending. Yeah, it- Not that I was disappointed, but I, I feel like I want to know what the characters feel more so than I want to know what the um, creative team has decided mm-hmm. they want me to feel. And I think, uh, well, a lot of it's just sort of a straight up tragedy in the Greek sense when you yeah. think about it, because it's somebody who basically just keeps screwing up <laughs> uh, and dooming themselves mm-hmm. cosmically, like almost through no fault of their own. Uh, just going back to the beginning, like you're a child. Right. You know, none of you didn't ask for any of this. And then you blow away your whole family. You're scarred for life. You like fall into the the control of this basically a predator, Silco, kind of. Uh, mm-hmm. And the, by the time that you grow up, whatever, you're an adult now, you're making your own decisions, uh, you're hopelessly lost. And there was basically nothing... Like, Vi couldn't do anything about it, no matter how much she wanted to yeah. or, like, had these good intentions. Uh, and I think it's her owning that, like, Jinx being like, okay, I'm having a moment of clarity and I still pick this. Like, fuck you. Sorry, bleep that out, whatever. <laughs> uh, I, I don't <laughs> know if you're still that. doing We're that. past that point. Nope. Fuck. Um, <laughs> Yeah, let it rip. <laughs> and it's the commitment to that that I think is the ultimate most important thing of the plot. And so mm-hmm. it doesn't really... I'm sort of repeating myself a little bit and just kind of that like the deaths of the characters don't matter. And that it, at the same turn, all the council making their decision at the end, they're literally saying like, okay... We're going to let them all off the hook. I'm not going to maintain all these demands. We're actually going to own up to our, you know, to our issues and our problems. And we're going to grant them independence and we're not going to go to war with them. Mm. But it's like, it doesn't matter. It's too late. And that's another, like, it's just a sting, like a bitter sting of tragedy. Just being like, if Jinx could just get out of her own way for a minute, Mm -hmm. things would have been fine. And it's exactly the same thing as what happened (laughs) at the end of the third episode, because if she had not set that bomb in the factory, everyone would have gotten away. They had already gotten Vander's yeah. you know, um, cuffs off. They'd already opened up the wall. They would have made it, and she ruined it, which is just awful. And like that kind of like hollow feeling of like, oh my god, like you were so close to getting it, and then your actions ruined this for everyone in a really horrible way. Uh, it's something I like about the show a lot. <laughs> and then just to have it at the end be like, that's just who she is. She's always going to keep doing that. I, it just like, it hurts, but it hurts so good. <laughs> right. Cause it, well, it, it's a satisfying idea because they, um, it's just presented with like great clarity, right? It's like every, every character in this show is cursed, whether they're cursed by, uh, the shimmer, either like being in control of the shimmer or or like literally having it run through their veins. They're cursed by knowledge of uh, this ma- ancient magic that has never been controlled. Right. Episode one begins with like a, like that shot of that painting of like a giant godlike explosion in the sky, which is kind of probably what happens at the very end of this whole show that we don't even quite see. But theoretically, the show could just end with another 
kind of like historic explosion. Like everybody is, and then Hex Core, Hex Core or Hex Corp? What do you, what do we call it? Core. Core. Yeah, the Hex Core like curses characters as well. Just this kind of knowledge, access to resources, lack of access, or just you know like bad decision making over and over again. Um, everybody's got like this curse. Uh, so it is a very small story. Like I thought the show was going to, you know, we do get a look at the tree house, as I mentioned, but um, it is really a, a small story. And I think it that plays to its benefit. It doesn't explode the world up as the show goes on, even though we see more of the world. Um, we don't really meet a whole lot of new characters, which I think is great. It, it really limits um, like who you have to invest in, because I just feel like that can be very exhausting with shows that yeah that run on, you know. Well, that's another thing I was. We talked about this earlier today. It's the same conversation about like TV sucks and I can't get into it anymore because there's too much. I mean, another thing that makes Arcane, I think, so special, like why I was so invested in it is because it's just so character driven. Not news to anybody who's been listening to these podcast episodes, but worth repeating, I think almost no time is spent on extraneous characters. Uh, and I, I guess you could nitpick the show for how they handle some of those characters. Um, Cause I'm curious what you think about Victor's whole sort of final arc involves this woman who we really don't get to know very well at all, just getting annihilated by the hex core. And that kind of kicks off a little bit of a, an angst, well, more angst for Victor on his his situation. And so mm -hmm. that character seems to be in the plot to serve a very specific purpose, and therefore she's not super dimensional. Um, then again, I find it kind of hard to criticize the show for something like that, because how can you possibly flesh out every single character? I just don't think that's reasonable. But, right. you know, and like Jace's mom or whatever. Like we have these side characters that are there and they're flit in and out of the story as needed whatever mm -hmm. it's like the main thing is really it's about this like group of kids and some shitty adults <laughs> and comparing and contrasting their ethos and the actions that they take because really you can yeah. parallel parallelize most yep. characters when you're thinking about it and like vi and vander obvious like jinx and silk mm -hmm. are paired together obvious and then i just made the comparison with jinx and caitlin or you could do Jinx and Echo. There's a lot of just, you know, where they came from, what their deal is, how they choose to handle the horrible situation that they're all kind of in. That's why I think Kaylin is a good character, even though she might seem a little, just not as like attention getting as flashy as the other ones at first, but because her conflict is more relatable, I guess. Like you, uh -huh. you grew up in comfort and, you know, my parents aren't like the president or whatever, but... You know, I grew up in like a relatively comfortable lifestyle and I'm fine. I didn't grow up like literally on the street making street bombs. So mm -hmm. when you're, you brought, you might have a lot of preconceived notions about the way that things work like Kaylin does that are wrong, <laughs> but she's a good character to ride through some of this with and be like, oh, okay. I'm learning things on my journey. I think yeah. you can kind of get into her headspace a little bit. In conclusion, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's a good point. I, I hadn't really given her a lot of credit, um, but she does serve like a very useful purpose. And uh, I feel like she's the easiest to kind of empathize with because I I wasn't complaining, but I was just saying like the way Vi is makes her hard to really connect with. And of course, Jinx is like just a mystery box, basically, because you're that's the point of her. Um, but I do, you know, even like Echo... He, he's more like cool and aspirational. You're like, man, that's the type of kid I would have wanted to be. Like, yeah, he's, he's a badass. So, yeah, he like looks cool. He's confident. He's got a skateboard, hoverboard thing. Um, so there's all these characters that are thematically relevant to the story being told, but also are equally cool. And um, Caitlin's a little like she's cool, but she's kind of plain in, in the way that makes it feel like you're like, yeah, that might be me <laughs> if I was in this world. I might have like one good thing I was good at, and but also like really not get it in it's some like ways. Like wearing a uniform, <laughs> normal hair. Right. I don't know. Like has hobbies. 
That's pretty much it. And like Vi's like, I was in prison for many years and I have a really badass haircut and I'm very strong. Like all of those are very iconic mm -hmm. and just not the same vibe that Caitlin's putting out, which is fine. You know, a, a vibe I would, uh, it's, it's just funny. There's a couple moments in the show where I'm, I'm like, Ooh, this, this, this has like real rough edges and it's kind of like hints at darkness or just like uncomfortable things. Uh, I was particularly thinking of, you know, speaking of like character interaction moments, um, with Silka, we find out he has to like inject shimmer into his eye, I guess, to like keep him healthy. <laughs> so it's got this like awful device that just like punches a needle yeah, right into his eye. To be that guy. And um, like we get a great close up look and then like Jinx does it for him. It's just very, that whole scene is like perfectly upsettingly disturbing because you're like, don't do it. But then they have to do it. But she's like climbing all over him and like a, just like a, a weird way it's weird the show is yeah. is good at it's good with weirdness in the way uh cartooning isn't often able to pull off Speaking not since like eon flux really have i been so weirded out <laughs> i've only seen the live action version of that which is not uh, very good so right, we gotta do we're, we're gonna do some eon flux sometime yeah i'd like, like to watch will, the original you'll have a great time yeah um but yeah, actually, I don't know how much we want to maybe talk about this. I don't have too much to say about it, except that I'm sort of surprised that I don't see more people talking about it. But I think it was very well done. And it is that the disturbing relationship that Jinx and Silco have where it almost feels like, I mean, it's definitely inappropriate, but there are certain yeah. moments where it feels very inappropriate. <laughs> but I feel like they used that not to imply that anything like, I don't think he's, like, sexually assaulting her or anything like that, actually. But it's really just to show up that they have a fucked up relationship. Yeah. And I was like, this is actually a really smart way to do it. Because at no point do you make it, like, it's so tempting, I feel, for a lot of, you know, comic book artists, like, creators to be like, Ugh, and then the guy's, like, super lecherous and weird. And I'm like, great. I'm like, skip. Like, I got to <laughs> skip this part so I can go back to the actual show and, like, not see how weird this is. But it didn't, they didn't do any of that. And it was more of just like, this dude is like messed up. And like, he is a predator, but not in that way. Right. Guess, as far as we are aware. And it almost seems like he's messed up in a more wholesome way, which I feel kind of gross saying. But, uh, you know, I think some people really like Silco as a character and they're like, but he loved her. And like, he was a good, it's like, he wasn't a good dad. Like, but they, <laughs> they did have a weird dynamic. Like it right. was definitely not okay. But like at it's... the end, we get the sense that he really, truly was trying. Right. Like, yeah. I feel like there there is a moment where he's not uh, when they're all at the candlelit dinner that <laughs> the jinx is doing. The, <laughs> the normal the dinner thing. party scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like there's a moment where you're you're not sure who is lying and who's telling the truth. But um, then when it all comes down to it, he does really seem to have tried to really be there. For her, for whatever reason, because I guess we don't know a lot about him as to why he might, why yeah. he really picked her. Like, he really did seem to believe in her, like that she was going to save all of them, which I guess was, um, like, misguided. All of this is something that I sort of pieced together after the fact. Uh, and when I first watched it, I was like, I don't really know why he was just kind of fine with, like, adopting a child. That seems like a lot. And that <laughs> seems like a pretty sudden turn as well. So I, I was into it, like, enjoying the show and hooked, but I was kind of like, well, that's weird. I don't know why he would do that. Mm -hmm. And then watching it further and in reflection, it's like, okay, partially, now he gets to stick it to Vander, who he hates, by being like, okay, like, I'm taking something that you really care about. Fuck you. Uh, -huh. uh, but also she was just like, I, my sister and I are done. Like we're not one in the same anymore. And he was just like, oh yeah, this is exactly my situation. Like I know exactly how you feel and I'm going to do it right. He's basically just so married to his ideology and that's what yeah. he's kind of grooming into her is like, you should just have these weird conceptions about. He has this fixation on being betrayed. Basically, he got broken up with by his best friend and his, like, pseudo-brother. And he never got over it. And 
Uh, there are even scenes like the scene where uh, Savike and I don't remember his name, but the guy with the gold jaw. Yeah. The really yeah. cool jacket, the mm -hmm. annoying guy. Um, they're going to go in and like assassinate him. And. Oh, I'm trying to remember. He so Savika and this guy, they come in. He's going to try to kill Silco and like take over. And, uh, you know, Savika at the last second is like, no. And she ends up killing the guy who uh, remains nameless because I don't remember his name at all. Uh, but Silco's giving this whole speech about how, you know what we had back in my day? Loyalty. Like, you know what we could count on back in my day? Loyalty. Which is, like, not even true, obviously. <laughs> but it's, like, the only thing that he cares about. He's just so obsessed with it. And he's constantly, like, he's lying to Jinx to keep her around because he doesn't want the same thing to happen again. And, like, he doesn't want to be abandoned. And he's just, like, mm. latched onto this replacement for Vander, I guess. All of this kind of culminates in pro like one of my favorite pieces of acting in the show. And I think it's in the last episode when Silco and Jace are meeting on this bridge. This like weird, they're like on the ocean or something. Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea where they are. I was like, how'd you guys get to like the set of Game of Thrones? Like, where right. is this <laughs> it's a happening? Sunset. <clears throat> but Jace is like, okay, here's, you know, here's the deal. What do you want? So we can like stop having this conflict. So it goes like, here's mm -hmm. my demands. And Jace is like, my demand is that you have to give up Jinx. And it's so spectacular, the character acting happening in this moment that like, I would encourage you to go back and watch that scene again because Silco is all like, oh yeah, like I've got what I want. I'm feeling great. And as soon as he asks for Jinx, he's like, oh shit. And you can see it in his face, like instantly. He's like, wait, mm. what? Like, no, uh, mm, I don't No, nah, I don't want to do that. He has like a very human reaction. The animation yeah. in that scene is so good. Like, I don't actors couldn't act that good. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> Whoever animated that scene did a spectacular job. Right. Because uh, it really does tell you like in that moment, you know, he's not going to do it because mm. he really is that deep. And then it's just pay off the rest of that. Like at that point, his arc to me was like satisfyingly resolved because mm. I know his deal. And he's like at the, the fountain statue of Vander just being like, oh, my God, dude, I get it now. Like, I get why you did this to me in the first place. And that's just mm -hmm. the resolution of that is just so wild to me. And just being like. Yeah, this guy is a villain and like a terrorist and a crazy person, but he's also kind of just a guy having his own crises and weird problems and like not having the answers to anything and not even knowing why he does the stuff that he does. And it just, mm. it's very humanizing. But like really good character work on Silco in general, like a very, very well written character because he's a dude, like he's a person. That's very dimensional writing. I guess that's a nice benefit of, you know, the the longer storyline of a show is that, you know, a three episode version of this wouldn't have that version of Silco. He would be a little flatter, right? He would just have to be the antagonist. He wouldn't get to have a scene like this Jay scene, which ends, I think, with <laughs> with the line, we both have our shitty parts to play or something. <laughs> it's funny the way they throw swear words in here. It sort of breaks the Shakespearean like drama of it it's like now yeah, we got our shitty parts to play i'll, I'll see you later it's like, yeah i guess that is true yeah, i'm like surprised nobody ever just pulls out an iphone like right. halfway <laughs> um yeah i agree i feel like silco i i think it's always the most fun to give a villain a an arc right because they're they're always so dependent on an ideology that it just gives you something to play off of whereas like i i think like Jace is just kind of like being, he's kind of in a long for the ride, even though he has like political power. Like they, they don't treat him with much regard because he just doesn't have that darker side to indulge. Like uh, what, do we, what do we get from Jace in the last three episodes? We get episode seven. First time we see him, he's uh, working out. He's, he's just like lifting weights or something in the boiler room for... I think for, he's supposed to be like stoking the fires of the forge or whatever, but he's like got no shirt on, which strikes me as incredibly dangerous. Yeah, right. Like it's, it's like, <laughs> that was really funny to me because that's totally like in Marvel movies, they're always like, and here's the hot guy with no shirt on. And I'm like, but you had to animate this. Like right. you went out of your way to include this. 
<laughs> I guess is he trying to reconnect with his like father's like blue collar, his his heritage? Like he 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 seems like ashamed to be like uh, at the privilege level he's at. Right? He's always seems to want to try to connect with sort of like something more common in the world. Yeah, to, I think he right? wants to kind of delude himself into thinking that he is that like I'm working class and it's not like he wasn't it's just that he's not working class in the way that like the Zon people are right and so he has this you know I'm from like I want to help the real people out there da 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 but he also still has all these prejudices against people that came from a lower situation uh, yeah. and had no resources to better themselves and so I get he is naive about things in the same way that Caitlin is a little bit and then he's mm. just like, politics? I don't want to be in politics, but has no real awareness of the reality of how any of that stuff even works. Right. It, it's one of those, like, fantasy story tropes that, you know, most commonly, like, noted in Lord of the Rings, where there there was a time that we forgot and to forget is a danger, right? Like, there there seems to be, like, a lost history to this land, including the magic that we... The magic is the evidence of this lost history that... Everybody's sort of adrift because they, I don't know, did they, did they have libraries? Maybe not, <laughs> but there doesn't seem to be an archive of what's come before. So there are no lessons to be learned from the past, apparently, which seems to be like making a, everybody a little at uh, ill at ease in general. I would even say, honestly, though, that like IRL, there are libraries and stuff and we're still not very good at <laughs> not doing the same dumb <laughs> stuff over and over. No, attention spans aren't equipped to handle the power of the library. I think that's the problem. We never really figured out. I feel like libraries were aspirational. You know, it's like, you know what would be good for people is libraries. But you know what people aren't good at? Libraries. Reading, <laughs> Reading books. <laughs> yeah. It's our fault. Um, the library works just fine. It's We're the problem. <laughs> Makes you think. That's true. Um, other things I, I, I want to... Uh, now let's stick with the story. I have some like just uh, adoration for the aesthetic that I, I have some resolving thoughts on, but I'll throw those at the end. Okay. I like uh, as we kind of enter this third act, we get little bits, little payoffs for some of the stuff where like, oh, that's coming. Vi's getting her gloves. Here, yeah. here it comes. But it's funny how they don't, they're always bound to the idea that there are consequences to everybody's actions. So even though we get some cool fight moments, they're always tr they're they're never quite as long as I expect them to be, and they usually end with something awful happening that just sort of reverberates for the character for the rest of <laughs> the show. So, like, um, Vi and Jace kind of team up. Jace gets his like Thor like his axe hammer gun. Thing. Which I guess we know he's good at because earlier he was working in the coal room. So he's just naturally great at this weapon. Um, and it yeah, looks I'll be very honest, cool. The only reason I think I accepted that is because he has it in Team Fight Tactics, the video game. So sure. I then I accept it too. Because that doesn't really <laughs> make sense, but sure. Uh, no, I mean, I'm. It, it felt like it made sense for that exact reason. And it's fine. But I think it's actually okay. So. And here's why it's okay, because he almost kills a child using it. Right? He actually like, does kill a child using it. Oh, that's it's true. The kid falls, and I'm like, oh, my God, he's dead. And then they go down there. I'm like, oh, no, he's not dead. And then he is dead. <laughs> yeah, that is something I wasn't expecting them to show, honestly. As the kid is falling off the railing, because he yeah. shoots him, and he's like up a couple stories, and he falls down. And I was like, he will be dead at the bottom, and that's just that. And he's not, which is a realistic there. portrayal, I think, of such mm -hmm. a death. And it was just... Somehow I wasn't expecting it, despite having watched the rest of the show. Uh, well, then we even go on. Don't we meet the mother? Yes. Isn't the mother there? So it's not even like the kid's just dead. It's like, well, now that mother has to live with that. Like yeah. Like we meet the family. She coincidentally <laughs> is like one of the, I don't know, crime lords or whatever they are. This yeah. This conspiracy of crime lords. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a uh, a beheading, right? Right, uh, Mel's mom. What's Mel's mom's name? She's pretty intense. Oh, she like eats, she sucks a lobster right out of its shell. She's or terrifying. Really yeah. good character she, design, though. I think. No, she looks awesome. She kit. She cuts a kid's head off, right? Yes. 
That's pretty cool. She's like obsessed with the idea of like, a, what does she say? Something about like a wolf, a wolf with no mercy or something. Um, yeah. It's she like, has this kind of idea. Is it that everybody is sa- I guess it's kind of speaking to the idea of the shimmer. Like everybody's kind of like a savage below the surface or something. Yeah. I think maybe. her whole ethos is like, you need to be the biggest and the strongest. And that just means that I guess if you need to cut off somebody's head, you just do it. I guess so. <laughs> Which like, I see your thought process, ma'am. And it's interesting because then they make her daughter a painter, right? It's kind of like, how do we show the contrast to like that? It's like, well, the the her daughter is an artist. And a really um, good painter. It's a great painting that she ruins at the end. She's Well, it still looks cool because everything with paint, I don't think yeah. anybody working on the show could ever make anything ugly. Like they splatter yellow across it, but it still looks even cooler. <laughs> yeah. I do think it's funny. This is not relevant, but that she also doesn't. She's just wearing her white clothes while she paints, which I find incredibly unrealistic. That so another criticism of the show: nobody could paint in an outfit <laughs> like that. Completely unbelievable. Anyway, All right. So then we get uh, here in episode eight. We get you brought this up earlier. The her her name is Sky, right? The assistant, mm-hmm. Victor's assistant. Yeah. Yeah. So we we met her like once before. I don't think I had remembered, but she comes down the hall like basically monologuing to herself. So in case you don't remember who she is, she's kind of explaining her whole role in all of this. And honestly, like a lot of what she's talking about is like, I have a crush on this guy. Right. Because she does. She tries I- to get him to like walk home with her, and he's like, No, I'm gonna stay here. And she's like, oh, And you're like, Honey, move on. Like. <laughs> Find somebody else, girl. It's a little, uh, it's it's a little bit clunky, but not very clunky, really. There's something about the way the voice acting is done. I know I mentioned this before, but for different reasons. I think I, before I was uh, noting the brevity, I'm like, oh, everything is very succinct. But but um, there's like a natural way of speaking. A lot of these characters, there's like a nonchalance like i'm not gonna raise my voice approach to the voice acting in general and when she's kind of going through her thing i i really feel bad for her i work up like feelings about her just in the length of that walk which i thought was uh it's kind of a clunky scene but i think it was like done well on its own and in, in kind yeah. of a little isolated bubble because it's sad i mean she's just vaporized completely. it's horrifying honestly i was shocked when i saw that that's what i <laughs> I love this show because it was shocking to me, despite previous shocking moments I've seen in the show. I was just like, oh, my God. OK, you just you're seeing stuff in this show that I'm just not expecting to see. And I applaud them for that. There's little things like that that kind of like give me this darker feeling because just because I think I said this in the beginning, the way this being kind of like done by a French animation team and like maybe some of their, their relationships with like uh, history, like especially in times of war, I feel like, you know, being in Europe or like growing up in Europe, you probably have just like a different sense of what, it, what world war two or world war one or some of these wars where your country was like actually there for it <laughs> um, instead of like sending the boys across the sea. Like when she's vaporized like that, I just get such a an atomic weaponry type of feel uh, for some reason. Just because the show is it is about like the inevitability of war and destruction and what people will do, even if they weren't intending because they're toying with the power of the gods by like splitting an atom or. Uh, rediscovering magic like there was just something very dark about the choice to vaporize her uh, that just struck me yeah I think that I don't know there are a lot of little things like that in the show that convey meaning without just like oh this thing is full of demons or whatever it is like the Mm -hmm. way that Heimerdinger acts about it is not like you see 300 years ago the great cataclysm happened or whatever blah 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 he doesn't do any of that he's just like you got to blow this thing up now i've seen this thing before and it was real bad and that is more than enough yeah in fact better to convey the seriousness of the situation like you're mm-hmm. into that one painting that you keep coming back to you know showing this apocalyptic destruction this kind of renaissance type way it's that mm-hmm. it's that's that's what you need it lets the imagination run wild it conveys kind of the epicness of the event and seeing something like that 
how it just sort of happened so casually. I think like that's, it's not like it shot a knife out and it stabbed her. There's something more about like the total annihilation that it's just yeah. like, oh my God, like, okay, you know, this is actually really bad. <laughs> And we don't need to know why it happened or what it means. Nobody right. had to sit down and be like, well, you know, the thing came online and it craved blood. So what else? Like, we didn't need to hear any of that. I have no idea why, like, what exactly is going on there. And yeah. that's what well, made that's it so the horror good. Of it, right. Yeah. Yeah. There's something with, um, you know, something going back to the art style and the way it's indebted to art from um, like heavily religious eras. There, There's something lost when... Not that I think like religion should rule all narrative through history, but when you take it out completely and you try, be, like for example, Pixar movies have no religious tones within them. There's no sense that there's religion in the world of Pixar, but this show feels like there is religion here and it makes sort of the people's choices uh, really resonate differently because I feel like a lot of them might have spiritual beliefs. And their choices feel weightier because they might believe that God could strike them down or they might believe something is truly superstitious in ways that um, like other cartoon characters just couldn't because of the world that they exist, if that makes sense. There's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if uh, I might be like stretching it a little too far, but um, there's just something with like the way the art looks at certain times, the way it feels renaissance and just where you would see real art like that in the real world is in, you know, religious, you know, or funded by religious organizations. It makes it just feel uh, just weightier and historical in, in a way um, when stuff happens. <laughs> I love that. That's so interesting. I want to talk more about this. It doesn't have to be now, but... <laughs> Well, it just, it gives me a lot of thoughts because... Well, I have more. Do you want want me to expand on it? Yeah. Maybe you'll find a touchstone here because I was connecting this back to when we were doing Cartoon Saloon. And I feel like we had a great arc with Cartoon Saloon because um, a lot of those stories are about like the, the spiritual history of, you know, Celtic lore or Ireland or even the animators who probably grew up, whether they're religious or not, their families, their immediate families certainly are or like grandparents they lived with. And, um, you know, like uh, the, the secret of Kells, we get that great little bit. Speaking of our aesthetic, when when they're working on the book and it's this idea of the, uh, you know, the illuminated manuscript and swirls within swirls within swirls to the point where it seems like a human hand couldn't even possibly render them. They're like godly in that way that you need that magnifying glass to look at. Remember what that thing was called? It was like a dragonfly lens or something yeah i don't remember the name but i know yeah that was such a like an uh an artist thing to pull up and put in your movie because you're like i love to draw and you know what god <laughs> believes is that the smallest drawing is the most godly like it just is just getting back to this idea that like artists want to tell the stories that make them sound amazing that that's like such a thing but i i was just thinking i've always been thinking about that since we watched that movie and um it's coming together in a different way for this movie, but just the way they pay tribute to Art Deco and Art Nouveau, like really feels that they believe that, you know, like Art Nouveau was a movement. It was like people, you know, finding themselves outside of like the the rigid society that they, they were in. And Art Deco is a little different. That's more commercialized, but like the Art Nouveau, like the underground of the story is very Art Nouveau with the weird swirls. Everybody's a little odd and creepy because they're trying to break out of like the formal structure of the world. I don't know. And that doesn't exactly tie to religion other than to say that like these art forms are, you know, often kind of like go back and render religious narratives, I guess, but I don't know. I don't I know like how that this. all fits together. It works for me. Well, <laughs> Whatever. That's, that's like, what this show is. I'm <laughs> interested in that because I also don't have a conclusive thought. But mm -hmm. I think it might be kind of strange, actually, how little we acknowledge religion in media. Because I've never once thought about the lack of religion in Pixar. I'm like, of course there isn't. And I've never questioned it. Mm -hmm. But like for something that affects people so deeply historically and today it is really interesting how we cleanse it out of so much of what we do or yeah 
or we, you know, wink at it and whatever. Like lots of different companies handle it in different ways. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is not exactly the same thing. It's just interesting that you tied sort of some of like the depth of the characters to an idea that they might have spiritual beliefs, which A, I think is just like insanely high praise. I was like, that is how you write a dimensional character where they're not <laughs> even religious in any way in the text. And you feel like they might be because you think about them as a person. <laughs> And that's, that's one separate thought that I have. And then the other one is that religion is such a big, such a big deal, obviously. Historically, just around us, even if you are not religious, and then to an individual, it can be very affecting and it can be very compelling. Having these characters be wrestling with like moral choices and stuff, it does feel a little bit more important or interesting to take that into account, even though, mm -hmm. so nobody says like, Victor has these spiritual beliefs, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But like, he has these very passionate convictions in certain things. And he also yeah. like, to the point where he's doing what he's pretty sure is bad. And he's starting to realize, especially after the murder, <laughs> that it's pretty bad. And mm -hmm. he's like, I know we screwed up. And I, I'm, you need to fix it because I can't. Like I have tried to do it and I can't do it. And just to have those levels of conflict, I think mm -hmm. that's just bringing us into this whole other world. And that's something that makes these characters more interesting. And the only thing I can think to tie it back to that we've talked about before is Frollo from uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame because okay. yeah, totally. that movie is so unsung. And this is something we talked about in that episode well, like something that makes him such a compelling villain is that he has these psychotic religious beliefs. Not mm -hmm. to say that like religious beliefs is psychotic, but his adherence to it is very, you know, white knuckle like. Yeah. And um, and that's like a big source of his inner conflict, too. And he runs into a very human thing and he's like, OK, I'm going I'm just losing it because mm -hmm. these two things are so powerful and like conflicting. And that is so much more interesting than somebody just being like, mm, I want to kill everybody in the world. Like, meh, like a mustache troll. Like, that's how you write a third dimensional villain. Like, they have their own thing going on and they have their own conflict that they're dealing with. And it happens to be violently at odds with the protagonist at all. Yeah. Uh, and all the characters in this exhibit something like that. So it's not really explicitly religion, it is more ideological, um, right. foundational. But it feels the same way where they have these like deeply held convictions and then they learn something new about the world and then they have to process it. They don't just be like, ah, yes, I see now that blah, 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 blah. Like nothing like that happens. And that's another reason why I think the ending is so appropriate because in real life stuff just sucks and it just ends at a point and that's it. Uh, like life still keeps going. And I think that's like yeah. it's kind of a nice way to end a story where an inconclusive situation because that's just how everything is always going to be actually i hope life keeps going it's hard to uh it's hard to say <laughs> what life is outside of <laughs> like the immediacy of like this urban fantasy hellscape that these poor characters are all kind of like well there is the treehouse right? place there's the tree so yeah hopefully that tree is still fine. there we don't we don't know where the tree is in context to uh, Ground Zero. Of the, That's of the true. Bomb, Could but... be anywhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably intentionally because they're like, hey, you know what? The tree was 18 miles away, so everything's just fine. They're like, we're cool. <laughs> All right. Who else do we? Um... <laughs> Let's come back for that from that journey. That we <laughs> yeah, just I just want to <laughs> pause here and reflect on this episode probably being really weird. And I hope it's good because I'm enjoying this conversation a lot. It's if anything, it's unique. There is no other episode of anything like this. We'll say that. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think I could, I could, I could go down the wormhole of like um, using religion as, as like a to add weight. C c the only other thing that I'm, okay, this is a, a a world of tech. It's like a steampunky story. It's about politics and society. It's not actually about religion, but all the things. 
all the buildings in this world, like where did they come from? Why, why did we build these things? It's like with the hunchback thing. I mean, the, the, the awe inspiring sense of the hunchback, the reason to tell that story is to have a reason to paint Notre Dame, a religious building. And you can tell whatever story you want in that building, but it's always going to resonate <laughs> with its original intent because that's what it does, right? I, I remember talking about like the ghosts of the past. It's like a haunted house type of thing. This story of Arcane has that like weird resonance because it feels like, I don't know, Europe in the, the 1880s in a way. Like it feels pulled from another time where people believed certain things and they built things and they made art around that. This show like echoes with those, with that history, even though it's not really about that. So that is to say to the people who are like, why is I were baking this about religion all of a sudden? Um, I'm not really, I'm just saying the show is telling me that it was there at some point, I think. Um, anyway, I think it really does just, it feels like the world is real and it's cheesy, but yeah, like, you I guess could, it's as simple as that. You could look at Jace or whoever and be like, I know what he does on the weekends, you know, like it just in a way that yeah. if I'm watching the Lion King or something, like I'm not really worried about what Simba did on his day to day. Like, I just don't <laughs> think about it. No. Love that movie. Super no, he cute. Probably li- he probably slept a lot because he's a lion. Lying around, huh? <laughs> Pretty good. We got the jokes here too. This is a good podcast. <laughs> We're good at this. But now, uh, okay, let's. Can we talk about Viet or cool gloves a little bit? Hell yeah. Yes. Again, we get. Um, she just. Do I want her to use. The show is so at odds with what I think I want. What I'll say I want from something, what I really want. Like, I, I want contemporary tales of uh, normal, normal people, stories for adults, but I also want Vi to punch stuff. Punchy stuff, yeah. There's there's a lot of like cinematic reference points that I've kind of like pulled on. It, sometimes I'll be like, oh, that reminds me of that or this. But the way they shoot action, other than maybe like anime ish stylings, the the dramatic angles, like when the logic of how her gloves work, like she kind of like charges them by like uh kind of jacks her arm and then the little like uh gauge goes into the red <laughs> but we get it through like a very dramatic like high perspective angle there's just all these great shots that it's just like action like i've never quite seen done in anything that fight uh, kicks ass we should talk about yeah. that fight which Be- hold on let's be sure are we talking about the jason vi one or are we talking about the vi and the uh light yeah you're right no that's a good point lady. and i don't remember which one that both is. rule I see, yeah, both are great. I'm think I definitely agree, but the, I just remember my jaw being like wide open when she's fighting Savika in the bar. And oh like, yeah, that's the best one. That's style, yeah. baby. Ten yeah. out of ten for style. Amazing job. And that is one where I was like, I have never seen anything like this. And just like some of the things they were doing was crazy. Just like some of the light shots where it just gets all washed out and cell animated for us, like on a collision yeah. from the outside. I was just like, good God, that's so cool. And just like everything yeah. about that. I don't have anything constructive to say about this, but that was, it's just a part where the punching is really good. I heard somebody reference um, a great way to do action. I don't know if this is a James Cameron thing or something, but it's using a flash, uh, like one frame of white amidst uh like a somebody shooting a gun or like hitting or doing something because it leaves it to your imagination the actual like moment of contact or something and i feel like the way they use color blasts of like that you know the painterly swish of like a blade or like the smoke out of something the way they kind of obscure things with that plays to their advantage because it then it plays out in your brain and it actually works way better I think yeah. they're showing a lot of that stuff, right? A lot of the hits. Yeah, I think it's interesting how many hits take place with us just outside the building, actually. If you would, like, count yeah, the seconds. Yeah, right. That's true. And, you know, it's always a sign of, like, a good fight scene where aspects of the character kind of, like, come through in how they fight. Like, you could say that with a lot of, like, great kung fu movies. But I'm um, like, Vi, ha- she's really... She's not struggling with the gloves. She's very confident with them, but she's also like so angry with having to go on this whole mission. (laughs) Like she does a lot of punching the ground 
when she gets hurt or just being like utterly frustrated with herself, even though she kind of like has the power of gods at her disposal. I think that's a great look at what her character is going through through all of this. Well, that, yeah. Like she's em empowered and confident, but what she has to do is not at all what she wants to do in any way. Well, you know what's interesting about this? God, we are really hopping all over the place. Well, I remember, Sorry. I can't remember if it was in the first episode of the second. It might have been the second one that we did about this. Um, we were talking about Vi, who I love. She's so amazing. Again, named our dog after her. Very proud to be that nerdy. Uh, <laughs> but you said something along the lines of like, it's a little hard to get in her head, kind of, or it's like not as interesting. Mm. I spent, like, you contrast with Vi or with Jinx. Um, I think that's like very accurate. But I think Vi just has different problems and they're a little bit more, I hate that I'm going to say this, but like traditionally masculine where she's more mm. angry and less communicative. Yeah. But something, I didn't even notice this the first time I watched the show. I, I, it took me a while to see it in the third episode and they're having that fight at the very end. Vi's yelling mm -hmm. at Powder, Powder's crying and Vi hits her. And then she realizes that she she makes her nose bleed. She hits her in the face and her nose bleeds on her glove, like the wraps on her hands. Mm -hmm. And she looks at the blood and then she turns it over and sees blood from her punching all these guys. And it's like, that's a little bit of like an illuminating moment, I think. Or it should be. Yeah. I don't know if it really takes because she continues to be incredibly violent. But <laughs> for whatever reason, both these kids are very violent people. Uh, as children and as adults and her solution is to punch stuff i don't know if yeah. you want to lay that at the feet of vander because vander seems like he was like yeah me too as a kid and now i see myself in you and i'm kind of trying to to get you to walk a better path and then i just mm -hmm. um got murdered before you know we really like got there i guess and you had more traumatic experiences but what's interesting to me about vi is that she's super angry <laughs> super mad and likes to punch i think like that's her <laughs> wow. natural sort of reaction and but then also mm -hmm. is aware that it's a bad thing and it's just it's something that the show doesn't even get into and it doesn't really need to i just like that about her character another thing that it's adds just there yeah, yeah the texture is like she's so good yeah. at it too it's her thing but it's like it, being violent as a person is not a good thing for the people that you also care about. No, I think it's like what, uh, you know, Vander, yeah, like you said, has a, a history with punching gloves or something. That's why I was originally wondering if he was part of the game because he seemed to have kind of an action hero -y backstory that we were hinting at. But now it makes more sense because Vi at least knows that about him and is kind of like inherited that as a, a trait of value, if only because she doesn't know any other way to be, right? It's kind of like if you were raised in a family with guns, guns mean something a little more than just like a violent weapon. They're like part of a tradition. They're like things you associate with the people you care about. And it gets way more complicated. It's like her, her punching, like her relationship with violence connects her to like her only father figure in a way, right? Because that's something that as a kid was one of the few things she really truly probably knew about him. Yeah. Because it would have been like kind of exciting and mysterious and interesting. And right? I'm sure so, I could easily see it being a thing where he's like, you need to defend yourself because you live on the mean right. street. So I'm going to teach you some stuff. And then of course mm -hmm. she's, you know, like a young rebellious kid and is going to like get into shit. Um, yeah. And that's just part of it, I guess. You get the impression truly that vander was the same as he was a kid and he suppressed all of it to become a family guy like a family man and that's one of the things where silk goes like what is your deal like let, un unleash the beast kind of a thing <laughs> and it's because he's right. so mad because he knows what vander's capable of and really good at but that vander is like i i turn the other cheek like that's his energy to bring it back to religion again <laughs> Oh, right. He just won't go there unless he until he is really, really provoked. And then, you know, to save his family, he'll he'll go there. And so Vi is still in that adolescent. Like my first reaction is going to be to punch. Not mm. great. 
but looks quite cool. Looks super cool though. That's why I feel bad because I'm like, this is probably not good, but it's so awesome. Okay, uh, here I've got a question. I haven't asked you any questions. I'm in episode nine now. I don't know where you are. I'm. Just, I I'm not say. that we're growing in order, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, think, the, I don't know where it, we're this, at. This is like, well, it's a little moment from episode nine before we we get to the complete end. I think we're at the. We might be at the dinner scene at this line. Um, so Silco, Jinx says that Silco didn't create her; that Vi did. W- was that a reveal to you? Like, I always felt that that was true. I always felt Vi felt responsible for what happened to Powder, and Jinx knew it. And Silco is just sort of like on the outskirts of all of it. It seemed like the way they were playing it was that this was a reveal that, oh, Vi is now like, I don't, I don't know. I might have been like kind of over trying to read that scene, but it seemed to want to be some, some sort of reveal, but I wasn't really getting that. I feel like I, the cards are pretty on the table through this whole show. There's not a lot of like mystery exactly other than like who might bite it, <laughs> who might get shot at any given yeah. moment. I mean, I have mixed feelings about this. I don't feel like I wasn't like, whoa, my mind is blown when I was watching it. But I was just like, well, this is an interesting thing for her to be aware of, I guess. Oh, yeah, I guess it's more of an awareness her, her kind of I, like, like to be so straightforward about it, it that she could mm-hmm. just be like, hey, guess what? Like, this is actually my real deal. Yeah. Uh, and then also to me, I think I'm just sitting here as an outsider being like, that's not fair. Which feels kind of silly. These are not real hmm. people. And she's really young and like in the middle of a lot of crazy stuff happening. But that's like my gut reaction is like, it's not Vi's fault because she was also a child. And then it just, all of it ties back. If you, if you follow that line of thinking, that's like mm-hmm. nothing is anybody's fault because we're all a product of our environment. And so Vi did the best she could and it wasn't good enough. She couldn't have done better. Yeah. And so it's like, in a way, Jinx is right. But also, so that's what I was thinking when I first heard that, I guess, was like, damn, I mean, like, Vi should never have had to be like a surrogate parent to you. So that's kind of tough. Like, both of you would probably be better off if you had a rich family and grew up in magic rich people town in Piltover where everything's fine. But, and then they're not going to have the awareness to, and how helpful is it even to even like know that? I don't know. It's just another thing where you're like, well, this, this sucks. <laughs> this is a tragic story about tragic people and there's nothing, you know, to be done about it. Like this was just inevitable. Right. Is that, is that, I'm not going to look it up, but is that the definition of um, tragedy, like in, in a narrative sense, is it just about, is it okay if I look it up? And yeah, I mean, like to me, when you just, when you describe a tragic story to me, the main characteristic is that whatever is playing out is unavoidably inevitable in the way, like sometimes in a time travel story, it's like, ah, you thought you could go back and change that, but here's how time works. It's always going to have been that way. That's tragic. Stories are about time. So is it what is a tragedy? Is that what a tragedy is? Uh, well, I time. did Google it. It didn't really say that, but I don't think the dictionary <laughs> definition is very helpful in this regard. Okay. So it's more like the art, the artistry of tragedy, right? Yeah. Like how do we how do we put it to use? It seems to be like that's the the way. Yeah, yeah. I think you're or that right. seems to me like the most tragic thing. Yeah, I think you're right about that. And the first thing that comes to mind for some reason is Oedipus. I think that's just like one of the first Mm, things I read. And I was like, oh, yes, a tragic story where, you know, Oedipus gets told, hey, you're going to hook up with your mom. And he's like, no, I don't remember exactly what happened. So if I'm wrong about some of this, whatever, (laughs) sorry. It's been a long time. But anyway, he goes, you know, far away and he tries to avoid that. And then it ends up happening because of his actions. And that's like, to me, it's really nutty that even back in the ancient times, people were like, fate, man, inescapable, nothing to be done about it. Like, if, yeah. if a prophecy happens, it's going to happen no matter what. It's like, oh, God, okay. But yeah, and 
I think, uh, I don't know. It's just like tickling a certain part of the human brain to just be like, okay, bad stuff is happening in the world all the time. Maybe there's nothing we can really do about it. And it's like a coping mechanism. And that's why we have tragic stories. I don't know. Yeah. Eek. Well, Sorry. Really yeah. I didn't question than the one I started at than the one I, but yes, I mean, that is the definition of a tragedy. Well, I, th I think by episode 50, we'll get to it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like it, if it's not the definition, it's like a, a key characteristic or it's a great use. Yeah, I think you are correct. Um, I think it is about people's actions just kind of being on rails. Yeah. Uh, so dark moment again here in episode nine. Th this is a well edited scene that, that plays out great because it's another I guess I with this show, I love a scene that like leaves me wondering Ooh, are they going to kill them? No. What? Oh, oh, they didn't. Oh, they did. Oh, this is another moment like that where um, Jinx brings out the this the silver tray with the lid on it, <laughs> and Vi thinks that Caitlin's head is going to be on that platter, and there's even like a flash, which I I will be be honest and say I did believe that they got me. I'm like, oh, this show is just going to be like weird all of a sudden. Um, but it wasn't. But but it's funny that the show is kind of it was a very self-aware moment where I felt like the the directors were like, we know you think that we might go here because you've watched children die in this show a number of times. There might be a friend's head on a platter right now. But then like Jinx is even like, I'm not that crazy, uh, which just feels like it's. Uh, kind of breaking the fourth wall almost no it was i was like that's a very <laughs> unusual place to put our, like to sprinkle a little bit of humor for yeah. some reason and i did laugh at that point but i actually i was relieved when it, she wasn't decapitated no it would kind of there. break break the universe a little bit for that to well, have, i think to i would happen. not have liked like many times jinx begs the comparison between herself and harley quinn and i was like this is just gonna be like a like a harley quinn goofy moment. but does harley quinn do dark shit like that I, does she to be i'm not an expert i don't okay. know i feel like she doesn't do that on it my like that, that's pretty far i watched suicide squad the new one but um like the thing that's coming to mind most is the animated series um yeah that a couple of years any. ago but i watched some of that mm -hmm. Um, and I really liked it. It was actually pretty good, but she's very like wacky. And that's what it felt like to me in this was that if she had cut off her head or whatever, it would have felt very like, you clearly care about your sister and you have all these feelings about that. Like if you just cut off this girl's head, who they're obviously close with, I feel like that's just, it starts to feel a little shallow. Like it wouldn't feel as... I don't know. It just would have felt very flat. No. And so I'm glad they didn't go there. But I do think it's funny that they were like, oh, but characters like this would do that in other things. <laughs> and I, I did think right, that Right. If she funny. was a true villain. Yeah. It was uh, just a weird little kind of horror movie moment. It, it would have just been playing to the sensation of seeing something like that. It wouldn't have been narratively important at all. <laughs> and speaking of things that might or might not be narratively important, I don't know if you noticed this. Or if it really matters, but I love that they did this. In the very first episode, when they're breaking into Jace's apartment, Powder finds this little thing. And she goes, oh, like a real Valdiani, which well, who the hell is that? I have no idea. Loved that they put that in there because it shows that she has interests and knows stuff about the world. Like, it's just a uh -oh, random thing. She's like, that. oh, my God, this is a real whatchamacallit, like a real thing. And it's uh, here on the table. She has it still. I think that's really interesting. It's what oh. she has the little sparklers in. Oh, yeah. um, and it's just like shit like that, that it's just like, oh, my God, like, of course, she still has that. Or, you know, I, where would she even have put it? I don't know. Because if you think that, I mean, they lost all the stuff from that. I don't know if she had it in her pocket. I, who knows? But I do think it's a nice character touch that she's just like accumulated all of this stuff. Right. Like everything on that table is kind of like, here's me. <laughs> Yeah, I think you were saying that from like the first episode, it, like uh, watch it once for the story, watch it a second time for something else, watch it a third time for Another something thing, else. But yeah. a second time would definitely be to just sort of look at um, the set dressing. Because I, I feel like the characters' faces are so engaging because they're so well animated. They're so clear. The eyes are so... of Like Jinx's eyes, I, it was making me think of like 
the magic of you know like the bambi eye that everybody used to talk about you're like oh there's when they rendered bambi's eyes it was like just a we saw innocence in a new way all you know it's like jinx is her eyes kind of have a fluttery weirdness that's um evocative not of the same thing but just in a like magical like how does animation pull this off way so it's it was hard for me to look away from character faces is all i'm saying yeah. but i would like to Look at the tables more in another viewing. Yeah, that's why it's this show just asks you to rewatch it. Another thing that I miss, I'm tired of barreling through, you know, big budget TV series just to get to the next thing. That can be so mm-hmm. exhausting. And this is just something that I'm like, oh, I could sit with this and just marinate in it for a long time. And I don't remember what the order was. But I think it was like, watch it for the story, watch it for the art, and then the third time to put it all together. Oh, okay. Something like that. Yeah. But I think that there is a lot of that. There was a lot of tiny little things that I just didn't see the first time because it was all new. And there is a lot of stuff happening. So I'm like paying attention to the plot. And this is just an arbitrary shout out to the eye animation, like you were saying, which is unbelievably mm-hmm. good. It's one of the like biggest strengths, I think, actually, of this whole show. Mm-hmm. I think that's why it is so well received. We didn't talk about this, I don't think, uh, in the somewhere in the second set of episodes in the middle when Heimerdinger mm-hmm. gets voted off the council and he's just like totally traumatized and betrayed. And I was just like, I like really see it. Like they really are oh, pushing yeah. it. But I mean, he looks heartbroken and not in a corny way that just any character would be like something bad happened. It's like he like cannot believe what's happening and it is devastating and he's like barely even saying anything. It's just all in the eyes. I was like, that is, this is really well done. No, I remember what you're, yeah, I, I can picture that scene as well. And it's interesting because he doesn't have a lot of his face exposed, right? He is all just eyes, basically, because he has all that facial hair. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's really all you have to work on, which says a lot. Yeah, that's a great point. No mouth stuff whatsoever. No. Um, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about what happens at the very end to Silco, which I'll just, I can just recap here. Yeah, we've set the scene a little bit where we have, everybody's at this weird dinner table. We have Jinx, we have Vi, we have Kaylin, and we have Silco. We're all just chilling together and it's totally normal. Uh, And then people start talking. And it's just a conflict coming to a head. It's Vi trying to convince Mm -hmm. Jinx that they can, like, run away together and just, like, live together as family. That, you know, you can be Powder again and you don't have to be this person that you are now. And then it's Silco genuinely saying in, like, a heartfelt way, no, like, she is who she is now and, like, you need to go away. And, And it gets so tense i will be honest i actually didn't realize what happened the first time i saw it but vi and silk are just yelling at each other Mm -hmm. and jinx is having kind of an episode i guess is the only way i can think to describe it because vi is like hey remember like our family remember vander remember the kids and like all of this stuff i guess not really realizing how traumatic that actually is and Jinx is just having an absolute, like, her psyche is just shattering. And so, what's interesting to me about this part, too, is not that Silco is like, oh, I'm going to lie about this or, like, be weird and manipulative. He can see that it's really hurting her to think about that stuff. And he's like, you need to shut up and, like, go away. It's very weird. Like, he's basically the most dad-like he would have been at that point. And then he tries to shoot Vi. And because he tries to shoot Vi, Jinx kills him. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, and it happens so fast. That's why I didn't quite yeah. realize what happened. Yeah, I, I barely even remember. And I just rewatched it today. Caitlin's gun, I think, or somebody's like handgun got set down on the table in front of him. And he takes it out. Mm-hmm. And he is about to shoot Vi. And she sees that. And he just she just instinctively takes him out. And this is what I love about. I loved this whole part. I think this why that was so satisfying to me that I really don't care about the details of maybe what would happen after all of this is over in a Hmm. season two, whatever, because she is immediately upset 
and runs over and is like, I'm so sorry. I mean, she's like riddled his body with holes. Like he's definitely going to die. But what is so great is he's like, don't be upset. Like that you're exactly everything I like would have ever wanted you to be. I mean, he just says like, you're perfect. Mm-hmm. But what I love about that is like, he loves her so much that he's not even mad about this because she's so loyal to her sister that she would never let anything happen to her no matter who it was. And that's what Silco always wanted. So in a way, he's like fine with it. And I just oh, think yeah. that's like a very beautiful oh. end cap to the whole series. Yeah. Is is like I succeeded. Like I had a protege that is everything that I wanted for myself to have loyalty that could never be broken no matter mm-hmm. what, even if it wasn't to him. And I just like, all right, end, roll credits. Like this is the perfect ending for these characters mm-hmm. that like that is enough for me. You guys did such a great job, arcane people. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. That the the story is really pretty much over there, and then um, kind of the gun, the big shark gun bomb thing is kind of an epilogue ish uh, to, or like a cliffhanger more so. Yeah, and I do like. Maybe. I think it it helps to see Jinx have uh-huh. some agency. Well, yeah. I guess. Yeah, like at that point, she has an actual choice and she's like, I like I, I love you, Vi, enough to kill my dad over it. But like, I know who I am. And like, there's why, you know, this is just who I am now. Like, let's just like be us now and move on. And mm-hmm. I'm just going to do this because this is what I chose. Uh, so it is interesting. It's like she ch- she chooses both of them in a way at the end because of that. Yeah. And done. <laughs> I was going to ask, what do you want out of another season? But I guess that's kind of just a pointless speculative question. Actually, no. I mean, we should talk about that. Okay. Uh, We're doing What do you want? (laughs) I guess is a what do you want or what would you expect or what would you like to see? I don't know. What what question do you want? I think that's enough, honestly. That's not condensed so much down into a single sentence, but... It's enough to jump off on that I I hadn't really thought about it super hard. I think I'm a little bit over that point where I get really invested in speculation and stuff like that generally because I just don't, I don't know, I just don't want to. Um, It doesn't mean I didn't enjoy the thing and I spend a lot of time thinking about the thing, but I don't really like to think much about what the next thing is going to be in cases Mm -hmm. like this, I think, for whatever reason. But I'm actually kind of afraid about it now based on our conversation. And like not because like, you know, but it reminds me of like the things that I don't like about sequels and about Mm. long running things, because inevitably it seems to bend towards mediocrity at best. And sometimes it's just straight garbage, which I wouldn't want from this. So I don't know, because... I think why I want a season two is because I loved this so much. And really, in my mind, it could be anything. I kind of just want to see the next thing that the studio makes. I think Mm -hmm. that's the truest aspect of it. Yeah. And if they do make it season two and it just picks up where it left off, like I'll definitely watch it. I'm just not really thinking about it in those terms. And even if they did something that was not... I mean, yeah, I couldn't care less if it was League of Legends or not or some like original IP or whatever. Like, I don't care. Mm. I would just want to see these people do another thing. Right. Yeah, I don't mind if it if this is what it takes for them to keep uh, the resources to keep the team together or whatever, if they have to keep working with Riot, that's fine. And if they can just pick a new batch of characters and do... Well, this is the thing Stranger Things was originally supposed to be as well. It was supposed to be a season was one thing, and then it was just going to be something totally different the next season. But everybody loved the goddamn character, so now it's about how you're seeing your friends. I want this show to be about how these people are great storytellers, (laughs) and I don't care. I don't need to see any of these characters again. Like I was thinking, I'm like, oh, what do do I love that they're – I love their – they're doing stories, violent stories about morality 
in kind of dystopian genre, we could say. So I would like to see like a weird Western Ooh. setting or, you know, like something with gun. I feel like they do guns so well. They're really like, good at guns. What if there were like, you know, high noon shootouts and stuff like that? I'm like, that would that would feel cool. Like a whole new setting, not a city, like a different, whole different vibe with a different culture attached to it. I just feel like they could do it because they're so good at doing this. To me, logically, it doesn't mean do more of this. It means let them pick something else because they're going to do a great job with that. Like a yeah. chef doesn't need to cook the same fucking hamburger diner meal every day like a good chef can work with other ingredients a ratatouille uh, if you will yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah i think i think we would be we're like on the same page it's like well whatever you're gonna do we're gonna watch it and i would rather it be a new batch of story yeah instead of uh just a remixing of of what we've seen great job squad call me <laughs> <laughs> you gotta give them your number or we're just leaving it there oh area code <laughs> five 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 all right everyone thanks for joining us you can check out our episode archive and other facts about caitlin and i at cartoonfeelings.com you can tweet at us or join us on instagram and both of those are at symbol Feeling cartoons with an S. Hashtag. On dope. The end. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, throw that in there if you would, please. Yeah, if you have any thoughts like mine, like my good thoughts that you'd like to share or questions, you can write to us at Cartoon Feelings Podcast at symbol gmail.com. And if you're enjoying the podcast, comma, we would be so grateful if you would take the time to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or leave us a review or both. And share us with your friends. It would be nice. Somebody gave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts the other day, I noticed. Wow. So that was nice. Aw, thanks. Yeah, thanks. We're up to eight reviews now. So. Uh, oh my God, crushing <laughs> it. That's almost nine. The fans See are going to miss can... the bits. We're going to get some bad reviews. Uh, that's fine. When those bad reviews <laughs> come in, it'll stoke the algorithm just the same. Well, folks, that's enough uh, computer talk for now from me, and we'll see you next time. Bye.